Hello, my name is Kate Robinson. I am the head gardener here at the Charter House and welcome to our Flower Power Festival. Uh, I'm here with Miko and Charlotte. Just going to quickly say hi. <laughs> and hi. We're bringing you this uh, fabulous festival celebrating the power of flowers for health, happiness and well-being. Um, we're coming to you live from the Charter House. For those of you who don't know about us, we are um, a historic site, seven acres, uh, on the edge of the City of London in Clerkenwell. Um, we were a monastery in the 14th century and since then have been a Tudor mansion, a boys boarding school and an almshouse, which we are to this day. Um, the brothers have enjoyed this garden immensely over lockdown and so we wanted to bring it to you in your homes through this virtual tour. Um, and thank you so much for uh, your donations to watch this film. Everything goes to help the charity here at the Charter House. But I hope you enjoy the film. And here is my tour of the Charter House Gardens for you to enjoy. Hi, my name is Kate Robinson. I'm the head gardener here at the Charter House and welcome to our Charter House Gardens tour. The Charter House is an almshouse and historic site um, and we have 40 older residents that live here, which is why we are currently unable to open the doors to visitors at the moment. But I wanted to show you the gardens through this virtual tour and hopefully next year you'll be able to come and visit us in person. So we'll be starting in Entrance Court and the Charterhouse Gardens are made up of a series of seven courtyards and I'll be taking you through all the seven courtyards and the different styles within them. So we're here in Entrance Court and this courtyard you'll find three of the six mulberry trees that we have on the site here at the Charter House. The brothers like to say that the mulberries are from James I, uh, but unfortunately they're not that old. They're probably about 150 years old. We got them tested by a dendrochronologist and from written evidence it shows that they're probably planted in around the late 1800s. Um, the ones in this courtyard are planted in this uh, retained wall and so they're kind of bonsai in here. The ones you'll see later through the gardens are much larger. I'm going to head through into Master's Court now uh, where I can show you more of the gardens. So we're here in the Master's Courtyard. Um, this is a very impressive entrance to the Charter House and you see the uh, Tudor mansion and the large windows behind us. Um, if you want to learn more about the history then there are talks and tours on our website. I won't go too much into that. Um, the lead planters that we have in here were um, made for us in 2013 to replicate the original lead water butts that we have um, that we use for watering the plants around this courtyard. In the planters, they're planted seasonally, so at the moment we've just got scented geraniums and helichrysum and the variegated pittosporum, uh, but I will be changing that up and planting tulips and daffodils for the spring, and then maybe some summer bedding uh, and more flowery things next summer. Uh, I'm now gonna head through to the wash house court. So we're here in Wash House Court, which was uh, where the wash house was for the original monastery and the Tudor mansion, and is now where the laundry is situated today for the brothers. Um, there used to be a cherry tree in this courtyard, uh, which sadly died a couple of years ago, um, but we were able to get the wood from that cherry tree to make some beautiful bowls, which are on sale in our online shop. Um, the tree that we planted to replace the cherry is a Magnolia sobolii and it was chosen because it's quite a small tree with shallow roots but also it has beautiful white flowers which we thought would be nice because the Carthusian monks robes were white and we thought it could represent that. Uh, I'm going to move through into the preacher's court now. So I started here two years ago um, 
but before me, uh, Claire Davis, the previous head gardener, was here for 10 years. When she first started here, there wasn't much of a garden, uh, mainly just lawns, uh, mature trees and rose beds. And she saw a perfect opportunity to create a beautiful garden within the walls of these buildings. Um, she wanted to create an oasis for the brothers of the Charter House. Um, so what she did is, piece by piece, she created uh, small beds, dug out the beds from the lawns and created the gardens you see here. This area of the garden is Preacher's Court. It is um, different from other areas of the garden because it has more bold, vibrant planting than some of the other bits of the garden. Uh, her philosophy for this part of the garden was self-seeders, spreading plants, things that will move around within the gardens and fill the gardens so they look very abundant. The colour scheme in this area is very bright and a lot of clashing colours, things that you maybe wouldn't put together yourself but create lovely serendipitous uh, planting schemes. Um, so we have a lot of pinks, a lot of purples, whites, blues, all coming together in a lovely way. I feel that she took a lot of inspiration from gardens like Great Dixter and Christopher Lloyd and it's got quite a country cottage feel but in a modern way. Um, a little bit like uh, Sissinghurst or places like that. Um, the spreading and the self-seeding of a lot of the plants mean that the gardens change a lot over the seasons and over the years. So it's not the same every single year. Something will move somewhere else and you'll end up with uh, combinations that you wouldn't have thought of. Something will seed itself next to something else and you'll suddenly get a spontaneous combination of flowers that look incredible but you wouldn't have necessarily put them together. Um, the other thing here is that it is a microclimate so the uh, the walls of the buildings mean that there is slightly warmer temperatures in here so we don't get really heavy frosts which means that you can put tender perennials in here and even some annuals will last over uh, for another year where out of London they would probably die off with this hard frost that you just don't get here. Um, so it means that we can grow things like cannas and dahlias and salvias and they stay in the ground. We don't dig them up and move them in unless we want to move them around into different places into the garden. Um, and it just also means that we get things self-seeding like echiums which you tend to get down in Cornwall uh, and places like that which thrive in this garden, they grow everywhere and they pop up in various different spots all over the garden. Um, sometimes we have to move them around because they do get quite large uh, but it means that it's a, it's a, a lovely surprise every year of what's going to be coming up. Changing in the gardens uh, happens when things like the bed behind me that you see, the mulberry trees, there's two mulberry trees in this garden they have a very low spreading habit and so the branches tend to grow horizontally rather than vertically. They get quite heavy with fruit, they fall and then they reroot in, in the ground forming new trees. Sometimes the branches fall and they don't reroot and we had to remove them like this one behind me um, which then created a whole new bed that we weren't anticipating. Um, it's meant that we can try out some new stuff and we can grow different things that we weren't planning on putting in here. So we've sown the sunflowers for some height, we've sown uh, some annuals like the Nicotiana and the scented geraniums, um, but also there are things in here that are very spreading and mixing like the um, the geranium roseanne and the verbena bonariensis will spread and move around the beds. There's also foxgloves in here that will self-seed and move around, um, as well as some of the more permanent things that we're planting in here. So we're going to plant a tottering by gently rose, which is a loose 
shrubby rows to give more of that kind of cottage garden feel. Um, there's also hydrangeas and um, anemones that will come up at different seasons. So you've got great seasonal interest in this garden. So the plants that are in this garden, as you can see, they're very kind of spreading and tumbling into each other to give that kind of natural, relaxed cottage feel. Um, but some of the plants uh, are quite unusual. Um, so you have this lovely bright blue Salvia uliginosa, the bog sage. You have the dark purple Salvia armistad, which had great height. Um, then you also have the lovely mounds of the Aster Armistad um, to give shape in the kind of late summer, along with the grasses, uh, the Miscanthus and the Calamogrostis that we have further down. Um, the dahlias that are in here um, are, I think, twinings after eight, but I'm not sure. Uh, and we have things like the dark, the lovely dark foliage of the Agaritina and um, then the uh, physalis, which is just starting to turn orange now to give that lovely autumn colour. Earlier in the year, these beds are filled with uh, things like tulips and daffodils and uh, spring, uh, spring bulbs. Um, and then now we get into the, the late summer, uh, autumn time, the cannas really come into their own and the dahlias and um, the kind of the richer colours start to really show through. So planting in this garden is a little bit tricky because uh, the soil is very shallow and the uh, substrate layer is London clay which is very thick but also there's a lot of rubble in the gardens from all the bombing that we had during the war. There are also air raid shelters underneath these gardens especially underneath this courtyard so sometimes when I dig down more than about two feet I just hit solid concrete. Um, you can see the the changing styles with the different architecture in this square. Um, so you have the Tudor building, the you can see the Barbican, the modern brutalist architecture of the Barbican in the background. Then we have the, the modern brothers accommodation, which is from about 2000. And then the, um, the wing over this side, which is uh, from about 1820, 1840. So it really is uh, an eclectic mix of art architectural styles um, and a really unusual site in the centre of London. So the planting in here is really for year-round interest. So in the winter we have the amazing stems of the Tibetan cherry, the Prunus cerula, that really has that kind of toffee-coloured bark which curls up and you see through the light. Um, you also have the structure from the Catinus cogria, which is behind me, the massive smoke bush. Um, but there's lots of uh, other things in here that create structure and different textures. So we have um, the different roses. The bright pink one here is uh, Benjamin Britten. We then have a lot of uh, chinensis roses. So we have Mutabilis, which has the beautiful um, changing colours of the petals from a kind of orange down to pink in a slightly tutti fruity style. We also have one called Bengal Crimson which has lovely crimson red single flowers and we have Rhapsody in Blue uh, which and all repeat constantly through the year um, so you get different combinations. Um, the different dahlias we have growing here is we have the orange of the David Howard which really picks up nicely with the cannas and the prunus cerula bark and we have the Mexican star which is this simple really dark red dahlia which adds a lovely height and uh, matches well with the purple of the Agastache and the um, Salvia uh, Armistad. Um, and then I love to put clashing things, slightly clashing, so the Rudbeckia laciniata, the bright yellow with the purple and the maroon red, um, and the uh, Melianthus major, the really lovely green glaucous foliage with the canna indica, is lovely smooth red leaves. Um, there's other things like the silver foliage of the Teucrium fructans with the 
dark red foliage of the uh, Sambucus nigra eva. They make a really lovely combination. Um, and we have a lot of things in the spring like uh, aquilegias and uh, um, Californian poppies. We have perennial wallflowers. And then you come into this season and you get the seed heads like the teasel heads and the, uh, with the grasses and the verbena bonariensis. So you really get lovely textures and changes throughout the year. So we have a, a little wildlife pond um, which is really great for the birds and the bees, they like to drink out of it. Um, it has a small pump with a trickling water fountain so the brothers can sit on this bench and listen to the trickling water and the bird song and it's a really lovely peaceful spot for them to sit and relax uh, and reflect in the garden. So we planted this bed behind me uh, last year, in last autumn. It has some beautiful uh, tree peonies and lots of lovely hellebores in there. So it's a really lovely spring bed. Uh, but also you get a really great view of the uh, mulberry, the really gnarled lovely mulberry trunk. Um, and you can really see the age of it from this angle. So now I'm going to be heading through to Pensioners Court. Before we head into Pensioners Court, uh, I just wanted to point out the beautiful wisteria we have growing either side of the archway. This is absolutely covered in flower in kind of May time, um, but it has been repeat flowering all the way through the year, which is lovely. Um, it does want to try and escape into the windows, uh, but I have to try and keep it under control. So now I'm going to walk into Pensioners Court. So we're here in Pensioners Court. This courtyard was built originally as brothers accommodation, um, but now it is uh, privately rented accommodation. This courtyard was built in between 1820 to 1840, um, and is quite simple, but it's a uh, very lovely planting in here. We have this incredible Magnolia Solangiana on my left, and beautiful Magnolia Grandiflora on my right. Um, I, fortunately, I don't know how old they are, um, but I'm assuming that the Solangiana is probably around 50, 60 years old, maybe even more. Um, a lot of the trees that were planted here were planted around the 50s, uh, after the, uh, the bombing and the rebuilding, uh, when the Queen came to visit. Um, the tenants in the rented properties look after their own front gardens, so they do those, but the gardeners here are responsible for the lawn areas and the planting within those. Uh, they, we have these um, yew hedges with the balls in the corner. Um, Claire specifically asked for yew rather than box because there's a lot of problems in London with box blight, box moth caterpillar, uh, and diseases and it just she thought it would just be easier to use yew instead of box and the yew has been planted here for about four years the hedge works really well it keeps its shape really well and we probably clip it about twice a year to keep the shape um, I haven't had any problems with it and it still stays fairly small and neat uh, planted within the uh, hedges are roses that are Lea Tutu. It's a beautiful yellow rose. Um, it was chosen because it is very disease resistant. Uh, it repeat flowers continuously and the flowers have a lovely scent and lovely long stems which are really good for cutting and um, using in flower arrangements. The trees in the centre are Davidia involucrata, the handkerchief tree. They're not doing very well in here, and I think it's probably because, as I mentioned before, we have shallow, uh, rubbly soil underneath, and also there's a bit of a wind trap in this uh, courtyard. It's, it's a bit uh, windy for them here, and I think they get battered around a little bit, so as you can see, they're not the healthiest, but you know, we'll persevere, and uh, if we have to change them, we'll have to change them. 
So we're going to head through to the master's garden now. Um, you will see uh, above my head there are some skull and crossbones above the gateway as you go through. This is because the master's garden was originally the graveyard for the brothers. The uh, brothers have been moved that were buried there. They were exhumed and moved to Little Hanningbury uh, in the 1950s. So there's nobody buried there now. But there are still some uh, uh, grave stones on the wall uh, as a reminder of what it was before. So we're here in the Master's Garden. This is the furthest courtyard along and we have Clerkenwell Road, the other side of this wall, which makes it quite noisy in here. Um, this garden is mainly left as a more wildlife friendly area. We do a lot less uh, tidy gardening in here. We tend to leave the grass a little bit longer. Um, we encourage more wildflowers and self-seeding things in here. Um, it's also very dry in this courtyard uh, and quite shady because there's a lot of very mature trees in here. Um, so anything that can survive in here, it has to hold its own really. So we have a lot of uh, the Japanese and enemies. Um, the Xantidesias do really well in here. Um, things like the Hypericum and the Persicaria uh, work really well and Fatsias. Um, and the uh, Iris Fetidissima is really a uh, tough old thing that grows very well down here as well. Um, so things have to be quite have to be quite tough to survive in this garden. So we have some mature trees in this uh, garden. We have the plane tree, which you can see behind me, uh, which is reportedly the second largest in London, but I don't know how anyone can prove that. Um, we also have a coleraria which uh, has beautiful golden flowers. Uh, it's the golden rain tree, um, which did suffer a little last year, but is coming back now. Uh, it has signs of new growth, which is great, because we were worried we'd have to remove it. Um, we also have the last of the six mulberries, which is in the corner, uh, which actually hides our composting area, um, which is, as every gardener knows, the most important bit of the garden. Um, we also have a small liquid amber tree uh, which uh, has beautiful red leaves uh, when it comes into the autumn and winter. Um, so it's got some nice things down here but it's not often seen by many people. So we're now going to be heading into the Norfolk garden uh, but firstly I wanted to show you the vegetable garden. This was a box parterre that we replanted with um, raised beds so that the brothers could grow some uh, vegetables over lockdown um, just to promote their health and well-being. Uh, the kitchen doors are just at the end so the chefs can come out and collect any of the herbs and the vegetables that they've been growing and they can use them in the kitchens and in the brothers meals. So the sort of things that they've been growing is uh, they've been growing a lot of tomatoes, we have peppers, chilies, salad crops, um, rockets, um, we grow in a lot of beetroot uh, and uh, a lovely butternut squash which is just starting to fruit now um, and also they've had a lot of uh, peas and green beans which are uh, all over now. Uh, so we're here in the Norfolk garden. Um, the Norfolk garden is uh, called that because the walls that the garden uh, backs onto are the original cloister walls from the monastery that were rebuilt by the Duke of Norfolk when he was under house arrest here. Um, so we call that the Norfolk Cloister and the garden is attached to that, the Norfolk Garden. This garden is slightly different to the rest of the gardens. It's a bit more secluded, it's shadier and it's also slightly lower than the other gardens. So it has got a very kind of quiet, peaceful, uh, restful feel to it. And the planting is reflected in that. The, um, the kind of colours are a bit more muted than the other colours you've seen in the rest of the garden. It tends to be whites, pinks, purples, mauves, uh, and a kind of more relaxed, restful colour palette, um, rather than the zingy oranges of the preacher's garden. So the sort of 
plants that are planted in here were to reflect the monastery and the kind of plants that the monks would have uh, grown. So there's a lot of edible things. So we have two medlars, uh, two apple trees, a crab apple and uh, an apricot tree. Um, there's also a lot of herbs, which is why we have the parterre at the beginning. So the monks and the monastery gardens would have been mainly for growing things that they could use and they could eat. Um, but of course, it's also an ornamental garden. So there's a lot of uh, flowers in here as well. Um, and I'll take you through some of the things that are planted in here. One of the things that also makes this garden feel quite secluded and shady is the canopy of this beautiful flowering cherry that you can see behind me. It has amazing double white flowers and gets absolutely covered in blossom in the spring. Um, a lot of people think that it's a lot older than it is, but we have uh, film footage of a visit by uh, Queen Elizabeth II and she was here in about 52, 1952 and it was just a small sapling then so uh, it can't be much older than that but it is an amazing tree and it looks really beautiful when it's in blossom. One of the main features in the Norfolk garden is this beautiful agave parterre that you can see behind me. Um, the central agave has been in the same pot for about 20 years. Uh, I think it was one of Claire's that she brought here. Um, and then around it we've planted Santalina for the lovely silver foliage, uh, the uh, lovely dwarf blue agapanthus that come up at this time of year. And we grow the Cleome, the tall white Cleome, um, which we grow in our greenhouse here from seed. Um, just to add a bit of height and the Cleome are really great because they have this lovely feathery look about them um, and they just add a bit of impact into this bed. So some of the plants we have growing in here we've got the beautiful white phlox, we've got this lovely pink anemone, this is Prince Heinrich um, and then we plant mainly kind of like I say whites and pinks uh, so we put a lot of bedding in here, like the white cosmos and the white antirhinums, and they really brighten up this, uh, this area um, because it can get quite dark with the dark walls and the tree canopy. Um, we also have some beautiful hydrangeas. Uh, we have uh, paniculatas, which have the lovely white uh, pointed panicles on them. Um, and we have a lot of plants that really do well in shade. So we have things like the hellebores, the fatsias, um, the brunera. The brunera Jack Frost just has a lovely silvery heart-shaped leaf which really picks up the light. Also, um, you'll notice around the gardens a lot, um, like I said, there's a lot of self-seeding and spreading things. So we have the physalis in here again and we have the Euphorbia wolfenii, which has a really lovely all year round structure and shape um, with the lovely glaucous foliage and then the beautiful green uh, heads on it later on. Um, and for structure, we have uh, a Euonymus silver queen and a Pittosporum variegatum. That, that lovely kind of variegated edge which makes the, uh, the, the foliage a bit lighter and the beds a little bit lighter. Um, we also have these obelisks which were made by uh, a, a local artist for Claire specifically with the Talbot dog heads on the top which the Talbot is uh, part of Sir Thomas Sutton's crest um, and she got them made by one of our previous gardeners made a cast of one of the ones inside the building um, and they were remade out of iron to go on the top of the obelisks here. And we have pink rose parade and a blue clematis called Blue Angel. Um, and there are just a few of the flowers left that you can see on the obelisks now. So this is the final part of the gardens. This is the end of the Norfolk gardens and you can see the beautiful door into the Norfolk cloister behind me. Um, again, this is a lovely peaceful spot of the gardens and we replanted the bed that you can see under the walls. Um, last autumn we replanted it with a lot more kind of white flowers and uh, variegated foliage to try and really lighten up this area and make it a lot more peaceful. Um, we've planted things in like these beautiful tall white thelictrums 
and like I mentioned before, the paniculata, paniculata hydrangeas. There's ferns in here. Uh, we planted some um, Jacqueline Dupre roses, which have a beautiful white flower with a pink stamen in the centre. Um, there's also things like the comfrey is great ground cover, but it's a lovely white comfrey, and uh, we can also use it as plant food so we can cut it down stick it in a bucket of water and then that makes great homemade uh, plant food for the pots and other parts of the garden um, there's also this lovely uh, davidia involucrata the handkerchief tree now you saw two of them in pensioners court and they were looking a bit sorry for themselves but this one is incredibly healthy and happy in this nice sheltered spot with the lovely wall behind it um, and this gets covered in the handkerchief panicles earlier on in the year um, and it really is a lovely a lovely tree to look at when it's out, all out with its bracts um, and there's a lovely peaceful bench to sit underneath it and uh, the brothers come in here and they sit in here and read and it's a really lovely tranquil garden Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed the tour. If you want to find out what's going on at the Charter House, you can check out our website and sign up for our newsletter. You can also follow us on Twitter at the Charter House EC1 or on Instagram Charter House London or the Charter House Gardens. Um, you can also purchase the Gardens book written by Claire Davis uh, in our online shop, so have a look on our website. And I hope to see you in person next year. Thank you very much, Kate. I thought it was fair for me to join Kate at this moment so that she didn't have to thank herself for her own tour. Um, I don't know if any of you have already been here and got a sense of this place, but I think that tour really captured what the history of this place is like and how important these gardens are for the residents here in the Almshouse, which makes Kate a very important member of our team, not only keeping them loved, but also involving the brothers in their upkeep and their stories and what's going to get planted. Um, she plays a very vital role in doing that um, and has really evolved the garden since she joined a couple of years ago. Um, so we have the opportunity now for questions. Um, we haven't, I think I saw one question coming up during the um, during the talk, I don't know if anyone has any more. Um, one person asked, do you make mulberry jam? Um, we do collect mulberries and uh, we have a group of volunteers that does that most years and we give the mulberries to the kitchen here um, and they make various things, jams or um, uh, compots and things that they serve to the brothers. There's, there's something else we do in mulberries as well. We have a, oh, yeah. a little tradition. I'm not quite sure when it started, but normally in times of non-pandemic, we would have a special ceremony here at the Charter House when the berries start getting ripe and we invite the Lord Mayor of London along and he gets a sort of special... Ceremonial um, bowl of mulberries. <laughs> yes, exactly. A ceremonial bowl of mulberries. One of those un unusual uh, traditions we have here. Um, there's another question from Rick. How many gardens do you have? So currently, uh, there's just me at the moment. Um, because of financial constraints of the Charter House, uh, I used to have two assistant gardeners, but unfortunately they've, uh, they've had to be let go. Um, so at the moment, it's just me and my wonderful volunteers, uh, who without whom I'd be completely lost. <laughs> there's, a, there's another question too. Um, about the tall yellow rose with the yew hedge round, I think there must be pension support maybe. Yes, that's Leah Tutu, that rose. Uh, it's a Peter Beale's rose um, and it's a great rose. Um, is there anything specific they want to know? Just no, generally. just the name. Oh, um, Leah Tutu. Yeah. Leah Tutu. It's a lovely rose, really strong scent and uh, repeat flowering and disease resistant. It's great. Another question was, was um, I mean, bear in mind you've worked in a number of different gardens. Kate used to be at the Jeffrey Museum, if uh, any of you have been there, um, and worked in other gardens too. What makes Charter House different and special out of all the gardens you've worked with? Um, the thing about the Charter House is it's such a unique community. I think I really like um, the community feel of the gardens. The fact that the brothers really 
connect with the gardens, they use the gardens, they're out there all the time reading or kind of doing stuff out there. Um, also, the lovely thing about the Charterhouse Gardens, compared to, say, the Jeffrey, um, the gardens at the Jeffrey Museum, they are very constricted to a time period. So you can only plant certain plants. Here, coming here, it's been lovely, because although um, Claire Davis set out the gardens in a certain way, she was very, um, when I took over and I met her, she was very clear that she said, it's your garden, you can plant what you want here now. So it's great to be able to really experiment with different planting combinations and things like that in this lovely garden. Have you got anything you're really looking forward to doing? Um, yeah, I really want to get some more roses. I'm kind of, I love roses. So. I have to say this Flower Power Festival is already making us very yeah. keen on getting more flowers. Everyone's talking about such beautiful flowers. Yeah, and I really want to, after watching one of the other uh, the other participants of the festival, she was talking about growing cut flowers, so that's something I'd really love to be able to do, is grow more cut flowers and flowers that for drying and cutting, so that's something I'd love to be able to do. Mm. Um, I don't think we've got any more um, questions from the audience, so we could wrap up now, but it really just leads us to say we really, really hope that we can open the gardens back up to you, the public, um, next year, um, and so that you won't have to see us virtually, you can come and see us for real. For we, we, In normal times we would run both garden tours and open garden evenings, so we very much hope to see you there next year. Um, we wanted to just let you know, in case this is something that you might like to do over the weekend, that we now um, have a floral crown workshop live, which you can click onto directly, it's free. Um, you can find it on our What's On page, uh, which Kate did a while ago, and it's a wonderful way to make the most beautiful crown, either with uh, your own cut flowers or with flowers bought from the supermarket. Um, that's going on at the moment, and maybe some of you will also join us for other flower power events. Hope to see you there. Um, and otherwise, please do sign up for our newsletter, find out what else is going on at the Charter House. We are being very creative in finding ways to bring the Charter House to you in times of lockdown. Um, and once again, hoping to see you here again sometime soon. Thanks very much. Thank you very Goodbye. much. Goodbye. Bye.